Hello everyone. Welcome to Gardening Green Expo 2021. The Expo is sponsored by WaterSmart South Shore, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, Kennedy's Country Gardens, Wild Ones South Shore Mass Chapter, and Edible South Shore. Now I'm going to do a little bit of Zoom education here. Um, when you are on the call, if you scroll your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, you will find something that says chat. And that's where I will send you links to resources and other things. And then you'll find something that says Q&A. And if you have a question, if you would type it in there, then we'll address questions when we end. So here we go. And I'd like to welcome Doug Tallamy. Thank you very much, Larry. Okay, here we go. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, I want to talk uh, about my idea, what my idea for nature's best hope is. But before I do that, I want to revisit what happened, not this fall, but a year ago fall. We had what we call an oak mast. Members of the Red Oak group all got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I stared at it and I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the, uh, out of the acorn. First it chewed a hole about the size of its head, forced its head through there. And then it forced the rest of its body through that hole. And it was a tight squeeze, made it look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally dropped down. Uh, this is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. Many things are after it. So it wiggles and squirms, gets itself below the surface of the soil in about 30 seconds, where it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. And this is what a weevil looks like. A lot of people think they have big noses, but actually that's an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that is how the larva gets into the acorn. We might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year? That's a good question, but red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Well, after they leave the acorn, of course, that leaves a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum, and nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of Temnothorax ants, tiny little ants that live in the vacated holes in acorns made by acorn weevils. And if they discover a new hole, they get all excited because their old acorns falling apart. So they tell everybody, time to move, and they get to work. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, and within 30 minutes, they have moved the entire colony into the new acorn. Then they post a guard, make sure nobody else comes in, and they will live in this acorn for the next two years. Well, about this time, my wife asks, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? My point is that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise most of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They will take an acorn from the tree and fly uh, up to a mile from the parent tree, then they will tap that acorn below the surface of the ground. And the object, of course, is, is to store food for winter. Um, well, not, they don't have great memories. They'll store up to 4,500 acorns every fall, but they uh, only remember where about 1,500 of them are. So they end up planting about 3,000 oak trees every single fall, every single jay. Found out this year what is pollinating witch hazel. Witch hazel, of course, is a, it's a small tree or shrub that blooms in the fall, late fall, well after leaves are down, after frost. Uh, funny time to bloom. If you look at the, the flowers during the day, you never see anything on them. And the book says, well, they're, they're pollinated by flies and gnats. Never seen any flies and gnats on them. But if you go out at night, uh, chances are you will see what is really pollinating witch hazel. It is uh, a group of moths called winter moths. Uh, the bicolored sallow is one of those moths. I caught a bicolored sallow on Christmas Eve. So they fly late as well. Now, I don't know whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of winter moths or whether winter moths are flying late to take advantage of witch hazel. But at this point, they're taking advantage of each other, another specialized relationship. You won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers anywhere near you if you don't have lots of carpenter ants because that's what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big 
big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have facilia. That's the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can reproduce on. And it turns out that pollen specialization in our native bees is quite common. Uh, we've got about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized. They can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plant genera. So for example, uh, in, in the Northeast, if there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head and on and on and on. Nature really is a series of very specialized relationships. The problem though is that today those relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of, of uh, Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Problem today is that we, we can't leave the country as it was because we haven't. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have, we have tilled it and we have drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland uh, in the US. That is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done that? Well, I imagine we thought the earth was so big we could foul it forever and there, there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines, pretty scary headlines at a regular clip now. Things like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population gone. Now the UN says, wow, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, maybe in the next 20 years. And I love the way they, they report this um, as if it's just one more headline. They might as well say, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline as if it doesn't matter. This is not an option, folks. Losing oxygen is not an option. Losing a million species is not an option. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that box. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this, this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson, you know E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, uh, the most famous entomologist of all times, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper called The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. <coughs> Excuse me. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically alter energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish, those food webs would collapse and, and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly uh, turn over nutrients. And all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those, those drastic changes. The good news is that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, let me remind you that humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature, totally dependent on what we call ecosystem services. Those things produced by healthy ecosystems that keep us and everything else alive on this planet. Here's what plants give us. A few of the things that plants give us. How about oxygen? That's important. They clean our water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to, to uh, use. 
carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, building their tissues out of it, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Carb uh, plants also build topsoil. They hold it in place. They prevent floods. They dampen severe weather and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. It never was a good idea, but today it's, it's actually a terrible idea. We've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. So taking huge areas of the earth out of production uh, is, it's just totally irresponsible. <coughs> there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now there have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods, but by and large our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area. Then we move to another area, do the same thing. Aldo recognized that is not a sustainable relationship with the earth. So he had this idea that we humans were actually capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm it and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we didn't destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he didn't talk about was uh, developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same time at the same place so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, and it's still embedded in our own culture. He may not have recognized it as an option. What I'm going to argue tonight, though, is that uh, not only is living with nature an option, it is the only viable option that is left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Now we need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature. We need to actually reconstruct it where there are a lot of people because that's almost everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where are we gonna do that? Well, let's return to private property. We will not succeed in conservation if we ignore private property because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignore private property, we're going to be working on, on parcels that are too small and too isolated to sustain the species that run our ecosystems. There are ops, uh, options for conservation that are not being used right now. We're not thinking much about them <clears throat> and involve an awful lot of acreage. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? 21 million acres in those types of landscapes could be used for conservation. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. You know, the, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Roadside, 7 million acres. Then we have all the places we live, both in, in rural areas, suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those landscapes. If you add up just these places, that's 599 million acres that could be used for conservation that we're really not uh, using right now. How big is 599 million acres? It's big, it's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, plus Montana, California, even Texas. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. There's plenty of places we can do conservation. Now, when I say conservation, what I'm really talking about is rebuilding uh, the natural world. Uh, not exactly the way it was, that's gonna be impossible, but we can still rebuild enough of those specialized relationships so that we have functioning ecosystems once again. But there, uh, some species contribute a lot more to ecosystem function than other species. They're the building blocks. So we have to start with them and then we can add the other species later. And two groups that we cannot do without would be those flowering plants. They're capturing the energy from the sun, turning it into food. Uh, and you're not gonna have flowering plants unless you have the pollinators that allow them to reproduce. So we need those, but we also, once the, the 
uh, energy from the sun is turned into food, it's in the leaves of the plants. We now need to get that energy from the leaves to animals. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something typically is insects. And it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So we must design landscapes that support a lot of caterpillars or we're gonna have failed food webs. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, that's the chickadee that is at my feeder right here. You have black capped chickadees up north that are doing exactly the same thing. Uh, during the winter, 50% uh, of their diet is seeds, but uh, when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds. So they have to switch to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they're not exceptions. 96% of our birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but these are the results of uh, a citizen science project that one of my recent PhD students did, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season. Uh, the idea is to get pictures of them when they were carrying food to the nest. Then they were going to send the pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify what the prey items were uh, in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diets of as many birds as she could in North America. Uh, and this is what you're looking at here, 20 common bird families. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diets in those bird families that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we didn't design landscapes that had a lot of caterpillars. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And the first is that they're, they're soft. So think of this guy as, as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle made of chitin, it's undigestible. The birds don't want a lot of that. And because the caterpillar is soft, you can stuff it down the throat of, of your offspring without fear of injuring it. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to uh, most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. Much of a beetle is undigestible uh, and beetles have a lot of sharp edges. And it turns out that, that uh, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get them from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why uh, my wife, Cindy, makes sure that I have access to plenty of carrots to get my beta carotene and plenty of tomatoes to get my lycopene and whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat those things, it stimulates my immune system. I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around uh, our body and, and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. Improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this male uh, prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. He takes those lutein's, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from in the breeding season? From what they're eating, of course, but carotenoid levels are not equally distributed among invertebrate prey items. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of uh, bird prey. The third bar is orthopteroids, things like grasshoppers and crickets and katydids. Uh, this bar down here, that's, that's the adult grasshoppers, the uh, moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's only the caterpillars that eat the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the earthworm, uh, um, the early bird gets the earthworm, I guess, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So for most birds, uh, apparently caterpillars are not optional parts of the diet. It's turning out to be essential parts of the diet. So let's just accept that, that uh, birds need 
caterpillars. The next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees and ask that question. There's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a, a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. And that's just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. Once they leave the nest, uh, they're flying all around, but the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to, to bring one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird through to maturity. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you've got to have that many caterpillars in your yard because they're foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if you don't have a landscape that produces that many caterpillars, you're not gonna have uh, breeding chickadees. And of course, if we don't allow breeding chickadees in our yard, in so many places, that's the only thing that's there. What happens to the chickadees? So if we design landscapes without enough caterpillars to support breeding birds, that's called insect decline, and it seems to be directly linked to bird decline. We went to the original data set from Rosenberg et al. They were the group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds that they looked at into two groups, the species that require insects at some part of their life history and the species that don't. Things like uh, finches and doves that can actually reproduce on seeds. They gained uh, some numbers in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove uh, cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as insects go, so go birds. So if you like birds, uh, we're gonna start needing to, we need to landscape in a way that supports caterpillars and other insects. And of course, there's many other things that require those, those caterpillars as well. And that, you know, I recognize that is a very different goal for landscaping. In the past, we have considered our plants to be decorations. We didn't want anything to touch them. They, wanted, they were supposed to be perfect at all times. So we used plenty of insecticide. We chose plants that didn't support any caterpillars and we had perfect landscapes. But now uh, we wanna have living landscapes. So uh, in order to add caterpillars to landscapes, we really need to add the plants that make them. How do we do that? It's not hard, but there is a catch. And that is uh, we, we, we have to be fussy about which plants we pick because most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. Why do we have to be fussy? Because the caterpillars themselves are fussy and nothing illustrates it better than the monarch butterfly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the calorie pear and all the burning bush and all the barberry and all the other uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Asian uh, ornamental plants that we import all the time and use in our yards. And you won't make a single monarch butterfly because the only thing they're gonna reproduce on is milkweed. That's called host plant specialization. Uh, and it turns out they're not special. Almost all the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. Plants want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that, that uh, want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And, and a particular insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are very similar and they develop uh, the enzymes, specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that minimize the caterpillar's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history for all of those adaptations to fall into place though. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating those particular plant lineages. They didn't adapt to any of the others. And that is why when we bring in plants from other, other continents, our insects can't eat them. They haven't been here long enough for our insects to adapt to them. And by long enough, we're talking about many, many thousands of years. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to reconstruct viable food webs where we have dismantled them in the past, we have to choose the plants that will allow us to do that or it's not gonna work. 
And I'm going to give you three examples of how easy it can be when we choose the right plants. So I'm going to start with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, Cindy and I live on 10 acres that was part of a farm that was broken up um, some years ago. Uh, the last thing I did was was mow it for, for hay. I'm sitting in this window right now, by the way. So there weren't really plants there at, at all. Uh, and what I wanted to do was to put the biodiversity back, see how much life we could bring to our property by planting the right plants. And by right plants, I mean the plants that support caterpillars. So I wanted the Canadian outlet. I had never seen a Canadian outlet. That's what they look like. That's what the adult looks like. But you're not going to have Canadian outlets unless you have meadow roof. That's the only plant they eat. Uh, well, our our area had been farmed for over 300 years. There was no meadow roux. It was, it was totally wiped out. I don't know of any meadow roux anywhere around here, although it used to be here. So I got some meadow roux seeds from someplace, planted them, and they grew very nicely. But, you know, I really, this was early on. I had little confidence that Canadian outlets were going to be able to find my little patch of meadow roux. So I didn't even go out and check them. And one day I walked by accidentally and it was almost defoliated with Canadian outlets. They had found them right away. So that was a big success. Now we have a good population of Metaru and a good population of Canadian outlets. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer, by the way. Uh, this beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. I did know where there was some Biden's Aristosa in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, Biden's, I planted it, grew very nicely. We had to wait a year for that uh, beautiful moth to come to our, our yard, but it has. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species to the property. I want to see if I could attract the Hackberry Emperor. <laughs> Not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It should be here. But as its name suggests, uh, it is a specialist on hackberry. And we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry. Um, we had to wait four, we have about four years for the uh, hackberry emperor to find our hackberry, but they did. I walked by one of my hackberry trees this June and on a single branch, there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillar larvae. So another big success. So now we've added six species and this is how it, how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own, but along with it came uh, a lot of the caterpillars that goldenrod supports. Goldenrod supports 110 species of caterpillars in our area. Beautiful things like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. Uh, it should be here and that's what its caterpillars look like. But this is part of the fun. Um, this, is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. One of these days uh, they will come and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Um, I don't know why people don't like this. It's a, it's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. Uh, it makes wonderful berries for the birds in the fall. Uh, it's actually a great pollinator plant too. It, the flowers are not showy. They're little yellow things, but um, actually greenish but they're magnets for our, our native bees. And Virginia creeper is one of the major host plants for the big sphinx moths that allow uh, cardinals to reproduce. Cardinals love sphinx moths. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Wanted to see if I could get the double tooth prominent just because it's a cool looking caterpillar. Well, it's a specialist on elm. I got some, some elm seeds from the University of Delaware, just scooped them up out of the curb, planted them, grew very nicely. And as soon as the tree attained any size at all, the double tooth prominent came. One of the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. So we planted evening primrose, the moth came. It sits during the day with its head uh, stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And we planted lots of oak trees. Uh, now, those are just examples of the plants we put on our yard, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important trees. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. It's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. And, you know, I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, if you can't enjoy it till it's 500 years old, you're right. You won't live long enough. But if you can enjoy what the oak is doing for your property, you can enjoy it immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks mostly as acorns, uh, but some as, as two foot bare root whips. And I can tell you that immediately they started to attract the moths, the 
you know, moths are adult caterpillars that run the food webs that attract everything else on our property. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the orange-headed epicalema, the red-washed caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panipoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks we put on our property, and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves, and here is a uh, crocus geometer, a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that that tree. Uh, so you don't have to wait long. You certainly don't have to wait centuries for your trees to start to contribute to your local food web. This is what our house will look like uh, in just a month or two. I'm still sitting in this window up here. Um, just to convince you that we were traditional, we've got lawn here, but we put a lot of plants back. Uh, that was part of the goal of rebuilding the biodiversity. And I noticed early on that the more plants I, I put in my yard, the more moth species came. So I made it a goal four years ago to start to photograph every species of moth I could find on the property. Uh, and I am still at it, but I'm up to 1,034 species of moths. That is more species of moths than there are all the species of birds in North America. Now we're on, we're on uh, 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the, the land mass, we're supporting 40% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because many of these are types of bird food, we've recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Uh, last fall, we saw this scary headline. World Wildlife Fund says that the uh, earth has lost two-thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, not at our house. Uh, I, I am sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two-thirds, and it didn't take nearly that long, and we did it simply by putting the plants back. So I'm, I'm telling you this uh, so that you don't despair. These are terrible headlines, and, and you know, if you feel like there's nothing you can do about it, then it is worth despairing, but there is something you do bad. Put the plants back and we can turn these things around. But I know what you're thinking. Maybe you don't own 10 acres. Will it work in a smaller suburban lot? Well, let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They own 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than uh, what Cindy and I own. The major invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is uh, Bush honeysuckle, Amur honeysuckle. So the first thing they did when they bought their property was, was get rid of their bush honeysuckle. They're in a typical development, by the way. All their neighbors had the big lawns and, and the Asian trees. They took out their bush honeysuckle. They put in lots of species of native plants uh, and also a water feature they called a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. They're up to 149 species of birds that are using their yard, 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on, on smaller pieces of land? Yes, it does. And keep in mind that their 0.6 acres is an island. It's not connected to any natural area. If other people did it, they'd have a bigger, bigger piece of property or a bigger piece of, of uh, restored property, I should say. Now, can this work in urban yards? Well, let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right on the other side of that wall is one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam only has one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. And she also is an island. She's not connected to any natural area at all. Uh, well, she did the same thing. She took out her, her uh, invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature for the birds, and then she sat back and started to count the birds that use her yard. And she's up to, that's out of date, it's 118 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house and check it out. What about city centers, though? 82% of, of us in North America live in cities. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly weed, which reminds me, we've got a, a serious marketing issue with uh, our, our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't, don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. 
2014, I'm staring at Monarch's Delight, and the first thing I see is two species, two species of leafcutter bees, megachylid bees. I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves. Leaves of red bud are perfect because they cut, they snip little edges at the uh, edges of those leaves and make these little semicircles. You've probably seen them. Then they roll it up into a, a tube, stuff it full of pollen, lay an egg on it, and that's where they reproduce. Then they put that whole package into a crack or a crevice. Well, there was a red bud uh, growing right next to the monarch's delight. Uh, and I'm sure that is why there, there were megachylid bees, leafcutter bees there. I'm pretty sure that's also why there were bumblebees there. Remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. So when they emerge in the spring, they don't have any workers. They don't have any helpers. The queen herself has to start that entire colony. So she needs a lot of, of uh, blooms, a lot of uh, nectar and pollen to do that. And redbud is perfect for that. It blooms very early. She can come out and get right to work. And then I saw a monarch. Actually, I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. Now, this was 2014. In 2013, I'd gone the entire, uh, the entire year without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point of the monarch population in the East. Only 3.6% of the monarchs remained compared to 1976. And it was June. So it was very early for monarchs to get this far north. Why were they there? Uh, well, they had monarchs delight, but there was another species of milkweed there as well. I think it's purple milkweed. So they had they had their blooms, but they also had their host plant. They could reproduce. They had everything they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. The High Line is a uh, it's a renovated elevated railroad. It was abandoned for years. Somebody went up there and saw a whole bunch of native plants growing on their own. Nobody had planted them. So they decided to make the High Line a tourist destination. They sunk a bunch of money into it and they did make it a tourist destination. It's very popular. Millions of Manhattanites go to the High Line every year. And this is the amount of nature we're talking about here. It's a little strip of planting along the High Line. This is Rick Dark. He uh, was always after me to go to the High Line and see the pretty plantings that are there. Well, I'm not much of a city boy, so I always drag my feet. But, um, you know, if I go and see pretty plantings and, and nothing's using them, that's actually depressing to me. But finally, he got me there and I went and I was completely wrong. In just 20 minutes, I saw all the things I just described. There were birds there. Somebody has done a study of all the bees using the high line. It's up to 30 species that, that are successfully uh, breeding and reproducing there. Uh, so uh, it, it's a very positive message to me. If thoughtful native plantings can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, 30 feet above the taxis, we can do this anywhere. We really can do it anywhere. There are four things we need to think about, though, if we're going to succeed in a big way. Uh, and one of them is we have to shrink the area we have in lawn because we got way too much lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of lawn nationwide. That's the size that's bigger than the size of New England dedicated to a, a deadscape. I mean, it's a status symbol. Uh, and I understand humans need need status symbols. We have to prove to our peers that we are, are good people and we're following the culture, but we can do it with less land. So let's replant half the area we have in lawn. We'll still manicure the, the lawn that we have. But if we take half the area out of lawn and put in productive native plants, we can create a new national park. And if we do this at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, plus Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all this park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we have a park at home? We get a lot of things. You, you get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the natural world. And you can do it at your own time and your own pace. All you have to do is go outside. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, millions of other people there. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike. No travel hassles. But this is the important one. You get to experience the natural world alone. This is particularly important for our kids, our poor kids suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. 
Um, so, you know, we're trying. We get 30 kids with a teacher, put them on a bus, and, and they, they drive for an hour and walk around a natural place. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home, and that's their experience with, with nature, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But what they really had an experience with is 30 other kids and the teacher telling them not to touch anything. It's so important that we allow our kids to develop a personal relationship with the natural world because they are the future stewards of that natural world, which, by the way, is not optional. We need the natural world. So if our kids don't know what, what the nature even is, they're going to be lousy stewards. So let them go outside alone. Develop that relationship. No parental supervision. They can figure out what works and what doesn't work. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives on a very modest piece of nature in Hawaii. It's a little patch of grass and a hedge. Um, but there are no lizards there. And she discovered that and sent me this picture to show me how you hunt a no lizard. You get on the ground, you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly towards the anole. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put them in an aquarium, and you've got that personal relationship with that little bit of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress hunting lizards the rest of her life. But I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee that that will help her be a good steward of the planet. If you want your kids to do more than hunt lizards, get this book, Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home, gives you dozens of examples of, of how to expose your kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, it's easy. You go to uh, this, this website, homegrownnationalpark.org. That's our new website. Uh, and join, we're over 5,000 people now that have, have uh, gotten themselves on the map. You follow the directions for, um, you know, indicating where your property is and how much of your property you are replanting or protecting in native plants. Uh, and then your little piece of, of your county will light up. You'll get to see how many other people near you are doing this. Um, maybe we can have competitions between, uh, between Massachusetts and Mississippi. Who knows? Uh, the object is to get our 20 million acres on the map here. We're at 1% so far. Uh, but, you know, why stop at 20 million acres? Let's, let's get the whole country on the map. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to... Um, then we have to replant half the area that was in lawn. Some of the plants we put in what was lawn have to be what I call keystone plants. What's a keystone plant? Remember the Roman arch? The keystone is a stone in the middle of that arch. And if you pull it out, uh, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. And that's because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs, which means 86% of our plants uh, are contributing, but not that much. If you think about uh, your, the, the reconstruction of your local ecosystem as, as if you're building a, an ecological house, the keystone plants are the two by fours of your house. They're not optional. They're, they're absolutely essential. They're not sufficient. Your house isn't finished when you just put up the two by fours. But for example, you can't build a house out of wallpaper. So you need those keystone plants and then you can add the other plants to round things out. The question no longer is simply, are natives better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. But there's a whole bunch of natives that aren't all that productive. And we want to focus on the ones that are the most ecologically productive so that we can reach success faster. And we certainly want to focus on them over the uh, non-native plants that aren't supporting our local insects. And many of them are escaping our yards as invasive species, becoming serious ecological pollution. Ecologically castrating our local natural areas, things like buckthorn and burning bush and barberry and all the ones you know about. I get emails once in a while. Uh, from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgo biloba, ginkgos from Asia, actually grew in North America seven million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America seven million years ago. Uh, we can argue about whether that makes them native today. 
Uh, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. I don't care if they're native or not. Um, it's whether they're productive or not. And I don't care whether ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars. There are two rare records of caterpillars on there, but they're, believe me, you're never going to find them. I've never found them. Where are you going to find your caterpillars? Where are the birds going to find caterpillars? Well, the most uh, productive keystone plant genus in all of North America and 84% of the counties of North America is Quercus oaks. They support 557 species of caterpillars. It, just in the mid-Atlantic states, that's 557 species of bird food and over 900 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. So this is how a keystone uh, oak uh, works in my yard. Now remember I've taken uh, 1,034 uh, I've taken pictures of 1,034 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. I'll get there soon. Out of the 1,034 species, 910 have known host plants. So there's a bunch we don't know what they eat yet. Out of the 910 uh, uh, species that have known host plants, 270 use oaks. And we have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property. And only one of them is, is oaks, Quercus. And we have hundreds of genera of uh, herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting 30% of our moss species diversity. That's the role of a keystone plant in, in my yard and it can be the role in your yard as well. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants uh, that are best in your county in terms of supporting the life around you will pop up. And notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. All the blueberries are native. Native birches, native maples. I have to say that because if you go to the you go to the nursery and say I want to buy a cherry, they're going to sell you an Asian cherry. If you want to buy a willow, they'll sell you a weeping willow from Turkey. A birch, they'll sell you a, a, a European birch, or a maple is probably going to be a Japanese maple. Um, hope they don't sell you a Norway maple. Even if you ask for an oak, you might get a sawtooth oak from, from Asia. They are all very common in the industry. So you have to ask for the native species of these genera. Because if you don't, you will reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the, the top ranked herbaceous plants. Uh, goldenrods are always way up there. The aster has been broken up into several genera. They're very high. Uh, perennial sunflower is very high, not only in terms of supporting uh, caterpillars, but also those specialist bees. Just with those three uh, genera, you can support over 40 species of specialist bees, the ones that can only reproduce in the pollen of those plants in your yard. But if you don't have goldenrods and asters and sunflowers, that's 40 species of bees you're not going to have in your yard. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants, attract a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. There's uh, a lot of research, research coming out now that uh, really convincingly suggests that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines. Uh, much of this is coming out of Europe, but we know it's happening here as well. These are all the ways that, that lights kill insects through exhaustion. The moth flies around and around and around the, the light till it just drops. Collisions with the light bulb, incineration, they die from dehydration. Um, the bat comes and, and picks them off. Bright lights blind our, our nocturnal insects, who knew? Uh, and it keeps them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. I actually find this really good news. We have to turn around insect declines. I mean, that's not something we can ignore. And this is a very easy way to do it. Just turn out your light, flick a switch. What could be easier? I know what you're gonna say. Oh, I can't turn out the, the light over my garage because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna get realize is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't wanna do that, there's a third alternative. Let's take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. The mercury vapor lamps are the very worst. They're very attractive to insects. Put in a yellow bulb and a yellow LED bulb is the best because it's the least attractive to uh, nocturnal insects. If we switch to yellow LED bulbs overnight, we could save billions of insects and also billions of dollars because that's a lot of energy we're saving. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. Uh, we're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights and then we'll invite uh, Mosquito Joe to come and, and kill all our insects. This is a booming business around the country. Everybody wants Mosquito Joe to spray his, his fog. 
and he will say, well, you know, this is a natural product, so it's okay. And it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids. It's made from chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural product too. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes. Not so. It kills all the insects it comes in, in contact with. Uh, but the big thing is it's expensive and it doesn't work. You don't try to kill mosquitoes. You don't, you don't control mosquito populations in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the adults. Mosquito Joe kills about 10%. So he's not even close to controlling them. And that's why he has to keep coming back and back and back and charging you again and again and again. The best way to control mosquitoes for a homeowner, this is something you can actually do, is get a bucket, fill it full of water, put some straw or hay in, in the bucket. Um, that becomes, it ferments for a few days and that becomes irresistible to ovipositing mosquitoes. They're going to lay their eggs in there. Then you take a mosquito dunk. Uh, you get a, a uh, it's from the hardware store. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a uh, natural uh, bacterium that attacks aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in, in your bucket here is, is a mosquito. So you put that in there, the mosquito larvae nibble on it, and it kills your mosquitoes. If a dragonfly gets in there, it doesn't hurt it. If your dog licks it or a bird drinks it, it doesn't hurt it a bit. It only kills aquatic diptera. And it's cheap, and it works. Why wouldn't we do this instead? Fourth thing we need to do is to uh, design landscapes that allow caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the, the leaves, it spins a cocoon from one of the branches, um, then it merges as an adult, and it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most of the species don't. 94% of them, 840 species, drop from the tree, and they either wiggle their way under the ground, if the soil is loose enough and they pupate under the ground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree and the ground is mowed and trampled and is so compacted that um, the caterpillars can't get beneath the surface. So this becomes an ecological trap. Uh, the moths come in, lay their eggs on the, the trees if they're, if they're good trees and um, they grow until they, they finish growing and then they drop down to pupate and they die. And the next generation is smaller and the generation after that's gone altogether. I'm convinced that this is another major cause of insect declines. Uh, and it's something that we need to, to turn around. The cement landscape is even uh, a worse viable option. It's not a viable option at all. Um, I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of cement as a default landscape. Uh, we know that it destroys our watersheds. Um, so why would we do that? It's also, cement is a, a major releaser of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. What most people do though, they put a, a, uh, a tree in the middle of a big lawn and nobody has measured how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this. I was gonna do that last summer, but the COVID said no. Uh, but I guarantee it's going to be higher survivorship in a situation like this, where you have a tree and then a layered landscape, maybe a, uh, a dogwood here, native azalea, ferns, ground cover. This is a safe site. Those caterpillars drop down. They can easily get below the surface of the ground because the soil is all loose. It's not trapped. Uh, it's not uh, compacted or, or mowed. Um, there's plenty of leaf litter on here. They can spin their cocoons in. And of course, in terms of managing watersheds, this is the way to go. This is going to absorb much more water than that than that lawn is. This is where you, you make your uh, spring ephemeral gardens. Uh, and this is how you shrink the lawn. The lawn also is a terrible option for, for watersheds. Shrink the lawn by putting in these gardens around your trees. That becomes safe sites for the caterpillars. And this is where you can use your, your ground covers. Things like wild ginger, uh, foam flower, may apple, ferns. This is a... a uh, hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. So any caterpillar developing on these red maple trees can drop down into these ferns. It's the middle of a city, but that doesn't matter. And it could complete its development. More good news from uh, another one of my grad students. This is uh, work from Desiree Naranjo, who, uh, by the way, is doing a postdoc in Massachusetts right now. Um, her results working with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington D tell us that there is room for compromise in our plant choices. And that's good news to me. 
what she did was compare how well uh, suburban landscapes uh, near Washington, D.C. could support chickadee populations when they were landscaped primarily with native plants or primarily with introduced plants. When they were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars than otherwise. Which So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% uh, more likely less likely to have breeding chickadees. So they all got nest boxes up, but the chickadees would come and look around and realize there's not enough food there. So I say, we're not gonna breed here at all. If they did try to breed there, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Their clutches were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. And if you put all that information into a population growth model, as a function of the, the percentage of non-native plants, non-native woody plants in your landscape, this is what you get. The dotted line here is replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at that rate, um, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. And if you make fewer babies, anything below this dotted line, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap generously, uh, which means you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native in your yard and still have a, a successful breeding bird population. It means 70% of your woody plant biomass has to be, be native. Um, so none of these non-natives can be uh, invasive. We can't tolerate that because um, that's, that's really serious biological pollution. But you can put your ginkgo in there. You can put your crepe myrtle. You can put your boxwood there. Those things aren't moving around as long as they don't dominate the landscape. And that's what's good news to me because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would be listening to this. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. Get more of these native plants into the landscape uh, and we can, we can tolerate some of the non-natives. Can we use uh, uh, native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a formal garden in North Carolina and they're replacing the plants in here with native plants. This is Joe Pye. Notice I didn't say Joe Pye weed. It is not a weed. Uh, and their goal is to replace all these plants with, with natives and take another picture and, and send it to me. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay over there because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a suburban lot like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a fence around it. Number of species here. Uh, meeting the needs of a number of species of native bees. It's not very big, but if everybody did it, there'd be a whole lot more forage available for our, our pollinators. Let's review just quickly why we need pollinators. It's not because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually around a 12th of our crops, but that makes people think if they don't live next to a farm, they don't need pollinators. Pollinators pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. It's not an option. Where do we need these pollinators? Everywhere, everywhere we want plants, including our yards. How about this? This is a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger than the other one. Uh, it's still neat and tidy. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. Seems like a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more are doing it. I'm hearing more and more examples uh, all the time. Minnesota is one of the first, has a cost sharing program, encourage homeowners to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. You get paid to do that. Pennsylvania, I just learned about this a, a couple of weeks ago. We've got a lawn conversion program. You get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your, your lawn. Uh, into a viable habitat. What a great program. I think Maryland has a similar program. <clears throat> Florida, uh, there's an island of Florida where they're paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If somebody has an endangered species on their property, you pay them to take care of it rather than fine them if they use their property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Uh, Missouri, I think St. Louis and, and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a uh, 
bounty on calorie pairs. You take out a calorie, one of the worst invasives that we have, take out a calorie pair and you get a free tree replacement. Even, even public utilities are getting into the act, giving people $100 coupons to replace thirsty non-natives with water efficient native plants. And of course, there's a number of, of um, lawn conversion programs in the far west, particularly California. Uh, you get up to $2 per square foot rebate by taking out uh, your thirsty lawn and putting in appropriate xeric plantings. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. Uh, and this is the first one. We like nature. Some of us even think it's important, but very few of us think it's essential. And if it's not essential, when, when resources are short, when push comes to shove, nature takes a back seat. There's always something more important. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which epitomizes to me our, our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's reasoning. We got to, we got to create the national park system so that future generations can en enjoy how wonderful they are. And I understand that, but that suggests nature's there just for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. Entertainment is not essential. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this. If we only do conservation where there aren't any humans, we're gonna fail because uh, those areas are too small and too isolated from each other. David Quammen has a, a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it, it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides. So let's, let's glue our rug back together again. Let's put those plants back. Not just so that we create biological carters so that plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats. We need to create viable habitats right where we humans are, where we live, where we work, where we play, and even to some degree where we farm. In other words, we're going to, we're going to take those keystone plants and rebuild life right where we are. We're going to start to share our spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewards of just a few specialists, a few ecologists, a few conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset is I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're really good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers what their obligations are towards earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, although it is, it is a good living, but you can save it where you live. And this approach empowers each one of us. And right now, so many of us feel absolutely powerless. The Earth's problems are huge, and it really seems like one person cannot make a difference. But in this case, the cliche is true. One person can make a difference. Go outside and plant that oak tree. Plant any of the keystone plants. Shrink your lawn. Put in a pollinator garden. Get rid of the invasive plants on your property. You, as one person, will have created a viable ecosystem right where you live, and you'll see the results. You'll become an important cog in the future wheel of conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you're going to start. If you don't own property, volunteer and help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a, 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 a park or a preserve. They're all underfunded, under, understaffed. They will love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now, I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well.
thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. That was wonderful. Um, we do have a couple questions that have come up. Uh, the first one was, will birds forage winter moth caterpillars? Yes, they will. Uh, winter moths, it's a, it's a non-native moth uh, introduced from Europe and um, like any other non-native insect that's causing problems. But this one happens to be in the family Geometridae, which means it's not hairy. Birds love geometrids and they don't care whether they're native or not. So our birds will eat them um, quite a bit. The problem today is that particularly where winter moth is causing problems, we don't have enough birds anymore. You know, we've lost so many of our birds. Winter moths are there right as the migrants are moving through. So then we run into a double problem. If we spray for winter moth, we've just wiped out not only the winter moth, but all the other uh, caterpillars that our migrants need. And then there's fewer migrants and around and around we go. Um, so right now the birds are not successfully controlling winter moth, uh, but they, they could be if we had more birds. Um, actually, the, 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 um, what I hear from scientists working on controlling winter moth, it's starting to look pretty good because they've introduced a uh, parasitoid that is, is uh, doing so well that the guy who's working on it says he can't even find uh, good winter moth populations anymore to work on. So uh, take heart, that's one species that we might actually win, win the battle with. Okay. Our second question was, what is the name of the kids book that you mentioned? Um, it's Nancy Stranisti, Nature Play at Home. Okay. Uh, then the third question we got was about mosquito dunks. How soon mm -hmm. do you put those out and how often do you change them? Well, you know, mosquito populations build through the summer. So it depends on, on your, you know, your tolerance, uh, for mosquitoes, there really are very few in the spring, at least where, where I live. And then as the summer goes on, they build up. So put it out whenever you want. It's not gonna hurt if you put it out too early. Uh, you just won't have uh, any or many mosquitoes laying eggs in your in your bucket. If you do put it out there, you're, it's hard to see whether something's gotten some eggs in there. So make sure you add a dunk after a couple of days anyway. You saw they come in a sheet like that. Um, so they're not expensive. You can, you can easily uh, do it all summer long. Somebody uh, asked me, well, why don't you just dump the bucket out and that'll kill the mosquito larvae. And that's true, it will. Uh, but then you got to start all over again, make your, make your little brew that attracts the mosquitoes, but that will work as well. And you don't even need to buy the, uh, mosquito dunks. Okay. And then another question we got was, what do we do about ticks? <laughs> well, the tick problems we have today uh, didn't exist when I was uh, young uh, because they come from too many deer. Deer are way out of whack in terms of, of their population size. Uh, so the ticks you're talking about that, that transmit Lyme disease are the black-legged tick or the deer tick. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they existed when I was young, but they were so uncommon, we didn't even know it. There was no Lyme disease. But now we've got so many deer, the whole, whole system is out of whack. We've got a lot of Lyme disease out there, tremendous tick populations. Um, so the ultimate solution is to control the deer population, get it way back down below the carrying capacity. In many places now, they're at least 10 times over the carrying capacity. Uh, but I know the average homeowner can't do that on, on his own. So what do you do? Uh, well, it's, you know, it's a big problem. I've had Lyme disease five times, so I understand the, the risk. Uh, their knowledge will help you. The, most, uh, the months where the risk of infection is highest are, month, are, are uh, May and June. I know you can get infected anytime, but that's when the risk is highest, so you can be extra, extra vigilant then. Think about how ticks get on you they quest, they crawl up on, on uh, vegetation, they sit there with their little legs out, and when you walk by, they, they grab on. That's how they get on you. They're not running through the grass and jumping up on you. Uh, so if, you know, don't go out and lay down uh, in, the, in the leaves or anything, that's a great way to get ticks. But if you walk through vegetation that's rubbing up against you, that's how ticks are, are grabbing on. Uh, so a good time to stick to paths, to have broad swaths of, of grass in your yard, and then the, the you know, natural vegetation off to the side where you're not actually touching it. Um, that's a good way to minimize your exposure. Uh, we, Cindy and I are very lucky because when we get a deer tick, 
we itch. And as soon as we start to itch, we check, you know, even on those hard to find places and oh, sure enough, there's a tick. You pull it off and then you put Neosporin right where the tick was. Uh, uh, this, we got this advice from a guy who studies Lyme disease at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania decades ago. You put the Neosporin on and uh, it takes hours for the Borrelia to get from the tick into, actually into your capillaries. And the Neosporin will kill it before that happens. And as long as we follow that rule religiously, uh, we haven't gotten Lyme disease again. I have gotten it again because once I had itchy toes and I thought it was athlete's foot, I didn't even check my toes. There was a tick right between my toes and I didn't put any, you got to do it, you know, within the first 24 hours, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, so that's a no cost uh, prevention thing. Don't wait and test, just put the Neosporin on there. Um, but it's a problem. I won't, you know, I won't, I won't deny it. And, and uh, there's something called Daminex, which uh, can help uh, kill ticks when uh, they get on, on the mice. Uh, the, you know, white-footed mouse is a, a, the third part of the cycle. It's, it's, it's cotton that is impregnated with uh, a, a tick uh, insecticide. And the, the uh, mice take it back to their nest and then it kills the ticks on them. And apparently that works pretty well. People have said that works pretty well. So those are things you can try. Okay, and then one more question again. What was the mosquito brew? Was it straw and water? Yeah, straw and hay or hay in, in water that ferments for a couple of days. What's happening is algae is building up and little diatoms are, are uh, in the water. And that's what mosquito larvae eat. So that's why uh, female mosquitoes are looking for situations like that. Mosquitoes don't like crystal clear water that has, have no nutrients in it. Um, because there's nothing for the larvae to eat. So you're creating uh, the same type of, of uh, uh, water mixture that you would find in a, in a swamp or a, you know, a, a shallow lake. Okay, so I think that's the end of our questions. I would like to encourage everybody, if you have any other questions, you can get a hold of me at info at nsrwa.org. Or you can go to our website for uh, lists of resources and links to all the native plants that we've talked about. And also we recorded this website. So if you missed anything, we'll have the recording for you. I'd also like you to encourage you to buy Doug's books. That's the best way to get it straight from the horse's mouth. And we are um, gonna raffle off one of his signed books. So that's also on the website. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you, Doug, for your presentation. You are quite welcome. All right, have a good night, everybody.